Amen. The true worshipers will arise and worship the King. He said in spirit and in truth. Amen. I can't help every time I hear that song and I think about uh, one of the preachers one time he's talking about uh, the wheat and the tare and as the wheat and the tare grow together. You know, he, Jesus said, he said, uh, let them grow together. He said, because if you try to uproot them too soon, he said that uh, you'll disturb the, the good. The, wait till they get mature. Let them grow together, and then there's going to be a time where there'll be a separation. And uh, one of the uh, ladies that was a wheat farmer, she said, uh, that to me said that scripture just comes alive to me because I know what he's talking about when Jesus talked about the wheat and the tare because he said as a wheat farmer she said we go out and of course we tend the wheat and we, we watch it grow and they grow together the wheat and the tare but said when the wheat become mature he said the tops of them get heavy they, they get weighted down because they are a mature and a good uh, uh, they're healthy and he said, when they start weighing down at the top, said, 
they, they bow down and said the tear just stands straight up. And said you can definitely tell a good, mature, healthy wheat is because it's bowing. And I think about the worshipers, are going, the true worshipers that, that bow to the king and, and worship the king, the king of kings, not a king, the king, the king, king of kings and lord of lords. Amen. All right, are we ready for the word tonight? Are we ready? We had a good message this morning. It was an anointed message about the anointing. And I think we're getting ready to get part two, part B, or ever, ever what he, uh, Randy calls the, the other part of it. And, uh, you know, the anointing is so, so awesome and so powerful, so strong. I don't think we realize it. And uh, that what we, when we carry the anointing, when we carry the presence of God into to situations or circumstances, and whether we, some, I guarantee you most of the time, we don't realize things change because the presence of God has entered the scene. And I know that Dr. Randy Caldwell is going to bring it out just exactly how the Lord gave it to him. Dr. Caldwell, are you ready? He stays ready. Let's make him welcome, everybody. yet I'm gonna wait on them are we on now well I can't hear it so I just uh, they're making too much noise behind me I can't hear it <clears throat> rejoice for the steps of the righteous man they are ordered of God they are ordered of God rejoice for the steps of a righteous man, they are ordered, they're ordered of God. In the time of trouble, God will uphold you, God will preserve you, God will sustain you. In the time of trouble, God's gonna lift you up, so rejoice your steps there ordered of God. All right, you know what? Let's sing it now. Rejoice for the steps of a righteous man. They are ordered of God. Ordered of God. Rejoice for the steps of a righteous man. They are ordered, ordered of God. God will sustain you in the time of trouble. God's gonna lift you up, so rejoice your steps, ordered of God. God, they are ordered of God. They didn't want to quit. Rejoice for the steps of a righteous man. Come on, sing. They are ordered, ordered of God in the time of trouble. In the time of trouble, uphold you, God. Uphold you, preserve. God will preserve you, sustain. God will sustain you in the time of trouble. God will lift you up, so rejoice, steps are ordered of God. Come on, give the Lord a hand clap of praise and amen. <laughs> I don't know if this is the right key, but we're going to try the same key. How's that go? Okay, remember how it starts. <clears throat> A country where no twilight shadows deepen. Unending day where night will 
will never be a city where no storm clouds ever gather <laughs> oh this is just what heaven means to me what will it be when we get over yonder and join that throng upon the glassy sea meet my loved ones and crown him forever What heaven means to me And when at last we see the face of Jesus <laughs> Before whose image other loves all flee This is just what heaven means to me. What will it be when we get over yonder and join throng upon the glassy sea? What heaven means to me When at last we see the face of Jesus For whose image other loves all flee And when we crown him Lord of all I'll be there Oh, this is just what heaven means to me. Come on, say you with me now. What will it be when we get over yonder and join throng upon that glassy sea? Meet my loved ones and crown him forever. Oh, this is just what heaven means to me This is just what heaven means to me Sun's going down, and I'm still saved. That's quite an accomplishment for me. Maybe not for you, but it is for me, amen? As some people, um, some people went to church today, probably in this state, maybe even this very county, could be in this city. Decided they got mad, somebody didn't do them right, decided they weren't going to go to church no more. I'm just glad I wasn't one of them. Amen? Thank you. Praise the Lord. Amen. Thank you so much for being here tonight. I, uh, uh, Y'all just kind of talk among yourselves because I uh, got to get my phone here and fix something. I was supposed to take a picture of this certificate today, and I didn't do it, so I'm going to do it now before I forget. And uh, we'll do it right there, and then I can send that later, okay? Those who wasn't here this morning, I got a text from Sister Diana Hagee while I was here in the pulpit. I'd send her a... Uh, a text message earlier, and um, she said, I want a picture of that, the platform, and then want a close-up of the uh, certificate. So so I'm going to send that to her. But that ain't got anything to do with you. So, all right, <clears throat> man. And uh, I, it's, I used to, in what to call my younger days, um, I hadn't done it in years, I used to sing every service, every service before I preach. And... Um, and I quit years ago. I, I just quit because <clears throat> it's just rough. And uh, so I decided I was going to try to do that every service this week here. Just, just, not, just, you know, and that's good for you. But I mean, it's better for me uh, because um, um, 
if I can do it here, I can do it anywhere. <laughs> Coach, all of the feedingest bunch of people I've ever seen in my life. Lord, it just, I'm still, I still taste what we had for lunch. It's just, uh, uh, Lord, I still taste pie from last night. But uh, anyway, all right, let me tell you real quick. Um, those of you, there's been several of y'all from this church. As a matter of fact, I don't know I'd have to, Mr. Renee. Now, my daughter, Kayla, is here back there and uh, tonight, and my wife and my son-in-law is on the front seat. You and Kayla fighting? Yo, okay, not fighting. Okay, you're just being supportive and they're not? Okay, is that what it is? Okay. All right. <clears throat> Y'all want to come? What's that? You made Derek mad and he's leaving. Derek, you coming back? I ain't got to take it. <laughs> I knew better than throw that out there. I knew better than that. <laughs> no, anyway. Well, now that the foul spirits left, we can have church. All right, so. <laughs> you know better than try. <laughs> yeah, I was camp, didn't we? All right, now. Uh, what I was going to say is, wife's going to have to help me with this. I guess probably this church, this area, there's probably been more people go with us to Israel. Right, wouldn't you say, Renee, probably from any single church? Maybe. Huh? You have a, well, that was, we hosted, I don't know what I'm saying, but it was just for us. But um, probably this, y'all, y'all are right there. One, one or two, uh, uh, maybe even three of the churches in America that more people has gone to Israel with us from a single church uh, right here. And I guess we're talking about Jeff and Eileen Hackleman. They went one year to, and they took a bus uh, and I, and I taught, they just, they went with us and I taught, went back and forth. But uh, I guess as far as going with us on a single bus, there's more people from this church that's going to Israel than any other church in America, amen? And so it's really cool. Maybe, maybe why I'm, uh, I love y'all so much. I don't know what it is. And, uh, but anyway, uh, we are going back. We did not go, I usually go in the spring and in the fall, and we did not do that this year. And uh, so our November trip, uh, this year is um, going to be November the 18th. I had originally said to the 30th. It's going to be to the 29th. And, uh, but uh, we are, this trip here, we will have literally a longer uh, tour on the ground than any other group that I've ever taken in 25 years. We'll have more time on the ground. I think we're going to end up with about, I think it's probably, two full days on the ground, more than we normally have accountant travel. And because we leave on a Tuesday and normally come back on a Thursday, and this is going to be on a Friday and, and blah, 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 and all that kind of stuff. But we're leaving on a Monday instead or Sunday instead of a Tuesday. So it is, it's going to be two full days, maybe two and a half days longer. And so we'll, we'll see more things. And uh, so, but anyway, uh, long and short of it is we're going. And if you'd like to go, uh, please uh, talk to us after church because I, I really, because of uh, campaign all that we went through uh, earlier this year, I have not uh, looked to see how many we have. I know we have people that are signed up and not sure exactly how many have signed up, uh, but I do know we've got more than I thought we did. And uh, so we'd love to have you to go. And if you've never been, and we are, and I'm just, I'm, I don't, I usually don't tell things until we get it confirmed but I'm 80% sure uh, on this. Uh, we've been talking with, uh, and I won't tell you who we've been talking with, but been talking with some people. And this trip, it looks like I'm 80% sure that we're going to be able to take this group uh, into the new embassy in Jerusalem. And uh, so it's, it's exciting. We've never been able to do that. And uh, especially now that it's in Jerusalem, it's very, very exciting. And so uh, we'd love for you to go if you would, would like to go. So it's about that. Brother Sam and Sister Tina was here this morning. Brother Sam's got to be in Clinton, Tennessee about, uh, I think he'll be there about 8 o'clock in the morning, 8, 9 o'clock. He's got like a five, six hour, hour out drive. So they went home this afternoon. But he texted me um, last part, like Wednesday of last week, and said that he had found some product that we had at his place had been stored, and there was stuff, as a matter of fact, some of them's already gone, that I haven't seen in a while. And uh, the message that I, I talked about this morning, this morning, we'll be talking about tonight, <clears throat> about the anointing, uh, they had some DVDs back there. Is, was there any hosted anointing DVDs back there? Are they gone already? 
Uh, they're gone already. And so, but we've got other stuff back there that we, uh, uh, the original God's Time Clock teaching. Uh, we've got one of those back there left. And uh, there's $100 all over TV. And, and uh, Ken, where's Sister Edie? Is she drunk? She's, all right, I said. I looked back and saw you. It's good to see you. She said, tell me hello. All right, well, I know we'll try and get her sobered up and get her here tomorrow night, all right? But uh, uh, again, Sister Edie went to Israel with us, I guess it was, was it last year? In 17? And um, <clears throat> I, I gotta tell you all this. Um, I'm sure I told you, but being she's not here, we'll talk about her. Um, Sister Edie is a, a very highly intelligent lady. And uh, if you don't know her, they, they visited here for when we're here. And uh, she's a, a note taker. And, uh, and she just, you know, I'd say something, she'd ask a question. So I'd, I mean, it became a, a, a me picking at her. Of course, you know, you know how the hell I'm going to do. I mean, picking at her. And she was a great sport about it. And, and uh, but she would ask questions. And I said something, or, or she asked me a question of, of, of something. And, and what was it? Shaka what? Shaka Lima. Shaka Lima, yeah. And that's not a word, by the way. And, uh, <laughs> And she said, now, what is the name of that whatever? And I'm holding the microphone on the bus, and I said, uh, Shakalima. And she said, Shakalima. And uh, I said, yes, she said, how do you spell that? Well, I just proceeded to spell it, you know. And uh, she's right down, right in the middle, she's right down. I just bust out laughing. And she looks, she goes, are you lying? And I said, yes, I am. And uh, she got tickled, and all of a sudden, Joe Klein just bust out laughing. And I said, what? And he said, Robin was writing it down. She was <laughs> <laughs> It was, I got two birds, one stone, wasn't even trying, amen? <laughs> so it was a great, great time, amen? But uh, anyway, so again, and what did I call you in Ezra for a week? Ed. Ed, yeah, Ed, I couldn't remember that. So called him Ed. I just decided his name was going to be Ed that week. And so, so here's the deal. If you've never gone to years with us and you're a Pharisee, these trips are not for you. <laughs> if you're easily offended, these trips are not for you. Because if I find out you're easy to pick on, you win the prize for 10 days. And so, but it's all in fun. I really enjoy it. And uh, so, but anyway, uh, the, we, we do have uh, a DVD and, and matching CD back there. Uh, our DVDs have been $15 and CDs 10 <clears throat> And this week, as we started, uh, I think last fall in different places in ministry, you can have a set of, uh, you can have a DVD for 10 and a CD for five. So you can get the uh, DVD and the CD for what you normally get a DVD for. Um, um, we saw these. I, we with these things we've been out of. Okay, the dumbest thing ever learned in church. Um, I don't know if y'all have ever heard that message, but it's a good. One. I've heard it. It's good. And uh, as a matter of fact, I've heard everything back there. It's phenomenal. You need all of it. Uh, this one here, the children of the corn. I preached this about ten years ago. Uh, probably close to 10 years ago at Cornerstone, Pastor Hagee. It's the first kingdom message I ever preached. And so uh, it's available back there. They're, they're $10 a piece. Our God's time clock, we have one of those back there. They're $100. Uh, you can have that one for 50 bucks. <clears throat> this one here is uh, we've sold these next two for 50. You can have even one of those for 20. Uh, this week, if you know anybody who speaks Spanish who does not um, uh, know about God's time clock, uh, this right here is a great one. This is in Spanish, completely in Spanish, uh, taught by Pastor Kevin Woodard over in Virginia. And uh, it's a great, great series. We have some of those left, and we did not know we had some of those left at Brother Sam's. Uh, but uh, then this one here, Beyond the Blood Moons, uh, we did find a case of these um, several weeks ago. I think it was as big as... I remember opening it up, and I went, well, dear God, that's blood moons. And I thought we were out, and so we had a whole case of those, and Sam brought some more. So apparently God wants people to hear it, and uh, the blood moon cycle did not end in 2015. It began. We are right in the, uh, in the, in the throes of it, and it's important for you to know where that we are. Get your Bibles out, if you would, and go over to Second Kings chapter number 4. And back there in the sound booth, I'm going to ask y'all to give me a little bit more boost in the house, if you would, so I can drop this microphone down because I'm scared to death. I'm going to knock my teeth out. And, uh, and these things cost money. And I'll wait on y'all for that, okay? You have store-bought teeth. I do. I've had them since 1984, and you never knew till tonight. Amen? Yeah. Pretty. The bottom ones are kind of messed up, but the top ones are pretty. But um, anyway, I just uh, 
when I was uh, growing up and, and before God healed me, uh, I took a lot of medication and when I was young. And uh, peanut butter, tall, and dilantin, and, and had done a lot of things, a lot of things um, uh, messed up. And my teeth was one of them. And so that's why I'm not a big advocate on medicating children. Man. And I believe that a lot of these things, and I know I can get criticized for this, but I think a lot of diagnosis today and uh, with children is because some people just don't want to have to take time to train. It's my personal opinion. Not saying that's the case every time, but I have seen some cases. They wanted to put my youngest son on Ridland when he was in the fifth grade. And I said, that ain't happening. I truly believe we have a generation of young people that are just screaming to the top of their lungs, find a new way to direct me, find a new way to teach me, find a new way to give me instruction, but for God's sakes, don't medicate me. Amen? And I believe it's a trick of the enemy. I do. I really do. So it's my personal opinion, my little soapbox for tonight. As I said, good to have uh, uh, my wife and Kayla and Nick with us this week. And they're going to be with us this coming Wednesday night uh, down in uh, Sitka at Father's House of Prayer. Brother Derek and Sister Crystal, the pastors there, are here tonight. We love and appreciate them very, very much and glad that they're here. And, um, and they brought a guest. And, huh? He wasn't going to tell that. But, uh, <laughs> that's right. <laughs> so, uh, but anyway. And so it's uh, always good to have it. It's a good crowd here tonight. Thank you for being here. And you didn't boost it enough in the house. So I need a little bit more so I can drop it down here. And I'm going to get loud and you don't turn it down. So there we are. You're a good man. Look at him. He's a kind of big boy. I'm not going to pick on him, all right? And uh, I believe Sister Cheryl and maybe Brother David is joining us uh, uh, via internet tonight. And um, it's uh, Cheryl Scarcy and David Rubenstein. And we, we have just fell in love with them. And, and and she's been, I don't know, maybe three, four times uh, with us to Israel. And I, after the first trip, I don't know why she ever come back. I pick on her worse than I did Edie. And uh, Edie thought she got picked on. Cheryl, she's, uh, she's took a lot of picking from me. But uh, we love you guys very, very much. Stand to your feet, if you would, for the reading of the Word of God. <clears throat> I'm going to have to uh, get this bottle open here. If you would, son of law, thank you much. And uh, I'm going to read the same text I did this morning. And then I'm going to catch you up, but there's just a lot of stuff. I tried to lay down this afternoon, take a nap, but I, I finally did. I laid there about an hour before I got a little nap and and because uh, my mind was whirling about. And guys, there's, God has really been speaking to me about some things. Um, one of the things he's really been pushing hard with me the last couple of weeks is uh, the steps of a righteous man are ordered of God. <clears throat> and uh, I'm going to preach that. I don't know when, but... Um, some really good stuff because, see, before you get to the platform, uh, you have to climb the steps. And I know the steps of righteous men. I understand they're talking about your walk. And, but to get up here to be able to speak in the people's lives, there are steps you've got to climb. <clears throat> and sometimes there's hell in the hallway. Amen. Amen? In time of transition. You can run into hell in the hallway. Sometimes you can you can run into struggles on the steps, and uh, but the steps are ordered. That's just in my spirit. I don't know if you know that or not. The steps of a good man, a righteous man, are ordered of God. Righteous woman, God's people are ordered. If you'll stay in the steps, you'll get to where He wants you to be. Amen. And uh, and uh, another one is on the Song of Solomon. I've just been listening to different things and and uh, hadn't really preached a lot in my lifetime from the Song of Solomon. But uh, I'm, I'm preparing something that I'm afraid I may get more flack over that series than I have any I've ever preached because I'm not sure song that Solomon was the man we think he was. In the Garden of Eden, there's a tree of knowledge of good and evil. And the knowledge of good can be and oftentimes is as devastating as the knowledge of evil. That's a tough one. The knowledge of good and wisdom of God. Solomon done exactly what God told him in the book of Deuteronomy, do not do. 
He done exactly. One of the requirements for a king, when he became king, is he had to write his own personal version of the Torah. Okay? He's had to write it. Copy it. The smallest letter in the Hebrew alphabet is a yud. And there is history that talks about Solomon in one particular scripture left off a yud. And it changed the entire meaning of the word. And that's why he began to do exactly. My wife's back here looking at me. She never heard this before in her life, have you, wife? Amen. And, uh, and he, uh, it changed the meaning of the word. And that's why he, he multiplied himself in wives. He married foreign women from other countries that God commanded them not to do. Because Solomon said within himself, I'm wiser. Go look. His writings are Song of Solomon. I've built this. Go, go read the prayer of dedication of the temple. Oh, it's a beautiful prayer, beautiful things that are said. But the eyes in me are astounding of what I have done. It's, it's going to take a little twist to it. It's going to be good. And that's why I believe that Solomon done what God said don't do. Because God said if you do these things, it will pull you, your heart away from me. Solomon decided he was wiser than anybody else. So he said, okay, I'm wise enough. It won't pull me away from God so I can go ahead and do it. And one of the things that Jesus said is not a jot nor a tittle. In the very next verse, he speaks of Solomon because that's what Solomon done. My, 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 my. Y'all want to go home now? That's, that's good. <laughs> so uh, God's really been speaking with me. And I, I like this. I like this return of revelation. I, I love it. Amen. So let's read a little bit, okay? I've done something with my glasses. Here they are. Oh, I didn't, didn't tell you about this. Have y'all, <clears throat> some of you who have not gone to Israel and those that came back from Israel, you've seen these little wooden communion cups uh, in our process of packing everything up because um, we've turned two houses loose. And uh, you had two houses? Well, more than that. Man, yeah. don't, don't look here. Don't waste all your mad right up front. We got an hour. Spread it out. Man. Yeah. And uh, God will bless you. God will bless you. And uh, uh, y'all sit down. Sit down. I'm just going to tell you what God, you're going to stand back up and I'll read my text, but <clears throat> God will bless you. Amen. And I shared with Renee this afternoon <clears throat> something that God told me years ago. He reminded me of here just recently. Well, I'm going to talk to you just a minute. Is that okay? okay? I like this. Yeah. I like this. Um, Years ago, when I began to study Genesis chapter one, and you can, you can answer this, not a trick question. What is the greatest creation that God ever created? What? Mankind. It's just the greatest thing. God makes it very clear. It's the greatest creation. He repented over it, but it's the greatest creation. On the pecking order of creation, on the list, when you go down the list, where is man at? The last thing. The last thing. God gave his best at the very last because that's the pattern of God. Wedding of Cana. New Jerusalem. God gives his best at the last. This is what God said to me. He was going to remind me this week. And we just, I'll just talk to Renee this afternoon about it. If you look in Genesis, you know, uh, Genesis 1 and 1 in the creation of the universe, then he starts, let there be light, oxygen, dry land, ground, seed, cause it out, sun and moon, our solar system, fish, fowl, beast, and then man. Before God created man, he organized everything. Put everything, because God's a God of order. Amen? And God used to preach it. Renee, Renee I tell you, when the kids were little, I preached it years ago, and God just, he's been reminding me of things here in the last month. Because see, God will take you through things to teach you stuff that you otherwise would not have learned. Because we can get complacent. We do. We do. Man, and one of the things that in this time that we're going through that Kyla, who was, uh, who went to the, uh, Renee and Nick took her to the airport this morning and, uh, and she was uh, flying down from uh, Louisville to Houston. One of the things that she said to me during the process of this thing that we were going through she was crying, and she said, Dad, <clears throat> this is really good for you. And I said, baby, this is tough. And she said, Dad, I know, but it's good for you because you haven't had to walk by faith in a long time. 
And I went, wow, wow. And it's true, it's true. And so it's just, it's a walk of faith. And he is right now, where we stand right now, it's a walk of faith. But here's what the God reminded me of. See, God gave his best, mankind on the pecking order, the last. And so this is the word that came years ago and I preached it and I'm just, I'm going, I'm going to bring it back. If you want God's best, you have to organize the rest. Before God will give his best, everything else has to be in place. Man, you don't like the car you drive? You want a new one? Wash it. I live on dirt road. You knew that when you moved there. I don't like the house I live in. You want another one? Vacuum your floor. Wash the windows. Come on, guys, stay with me. Does it matter? It matters. There's a pastor in northern Arkansas who's got one of the fastest going churches in Arkansas. His name is Todd Rogers. His wife is Karen Rogers. They have had a camp meeting for 10 years now. It happens every fall. I've, I've brought, well, to God be all the glory, I've helped him get uh, ministers there. The largest ministries in America has gone to his church. It's a town of, how many is there, Renee? 198, population 198 people. His church sits in the middle of a cow pasture. He consistently runs 300 people. In camp meeting, we've hit as high as 650, 700 people. And it's, it's 40 miles to the nearest hotel. Amen? And he told a story that I had forgotten years, just a few years ago, and I'd forgotten. He, and he was introducing me one night, and he told the story because I was teaching the organization thing then. And now, now I, I haven't gone through the parking lot, so don't anybody be offended, okay? <laughs> So if somebody has written wash me on the back of your car, we're not running you down tonight, okay? <laughs> All right. I personally don't like pulling up to a church in a dirty rental car. I don't like that. I, I usually find, you know, there's, I haven't done it every time. Sometimes I'm so late I have to go. But uh, he and his wife, and he was in construction, he started on evangelistic field. And he'd take receipts and he'd put up on the dash. His dash was just full. He came down and he said, Brother Randy, you know, we've, Respected you for so many years. He said, I want you to help me. I'm going to evangelize. What, what advice can you give me on evangelistic field? And I said, well, do you want some patty cake stuff or you want the hard line truth? He said, I want the hard line truth. I said, all right. Come here. He said, man, I've been, I want to come down. I told, I told Karen, you're going to give me some revelation. I'm going to. Come outside. See, I, I pointed his truck. I said, you see that dash? You got paper stuck all over. You can't even see your dash. You clean that mess off there and don't you ever do that again because when you pull up in front of somebody's church and they see that mess and that disorganization, they know your life is exactly the same way. He introduced me two years ago and he told a story and he said, I'm be honest with you, made me so mad I couldn't even see. <laughs> he said, I guarantee you it's been decades plus. Ain't been a piece of paper on my dash to this day. <laughs> You, you don't have to do that. Do you? It's just something that I believe that when you organize the rest, God will give his best. Amen? It's true, isn't it, son? <laughs> he said the other day, I just set it up there for a minute. I was going to get it. <laughs> Didn't you? Yeah, he did. It did happen. Yeah? <laughs> so when you organize things, God will bless. See, God cannot bless this organization. And there's been things that I've let go because I've been very comfortable. You might as well amen. I'm up in my business. It's okay. <laughs> See, when I'm in my business, you should amen because that means you're up next. <laughs> amen. I'll get up in your business. Amen. So uh, just, just do that. Organize. You know, I just, uh, I, it's just, it's just funny. It's just funny. I was out. Vernon Joyce's place, and I was here a few months ago, and and uh, and I've just looked around, and, and Vernon and Joyce are just nice. God's blessed them and raised horses out there. And you walk in that barn, he knows exactly where things are at. Exactly. He talks about bits. I have no idea what he's talking about. And here it keeps a horse from doing this. 
well, why would a horse do that? I, I, don't, I don't know why he would do that, but you know, he makes bits. And, and there was a good 100 bits there, hanging there. And he'd tell me what every one of them was. Yeah. See, God blesses that. He does. So there's, there's a few things when there's a lack of blessings in your life, you have to look around and see what the problem is. Because God is not into lack. God is into multiplying and blessing. And if that is not happening, something is out of place. <laughs> well, I've looked and I can't find it. Well, stop whining and keep looking. All right. I may be boring some of y'all, but I'm really enjoying this, all right? So uh, the, the uh, communion cups, we've got a few of those brought back. We were, um, what got me all off on this was uh, we are kind of packing things up and, and organizing things. We've been in the same house, been there. We've had the same house uh, for 15 years. And uh, it's amazing of the stuff you can accumulate in 15 years. Yeah. Stuff you don't even know you have. That you don't even need. Yeah. Clothes I haven't seen in three years. If you ain't worn it in three years, get rid of it. Amen? Is anybody soaking this up? Anybody? <laughs> so we found some of these and we found some stuff. So uh, being an evangelist, I said, hey, let's sell those. And... Uh, <laughs> We brought them back from years old years ago, and there's some of the communion cups. We, we brought them back for years, and I stopped doing it several years ago because we were getting a lot of them. But if you want one of these, Olive Wood communion cups from Israel, we've got, I don't know, seven, eight, nine of them back there, the $2. All right, that's it. All right, <clears throat> $2, you could just give it to me. I could. I really could. Would never miss it. I could just give it to you. But why would I do that? Then you wouldn't appreciate it. See, what you pay for, you learn to appreciate. You buy your teenager's cars, first car, like get on the highway and spill them tires till they have to buy their first set and then they quit spinning tires. Yeah. <laughs> Hallelujah. You're nodding your head, that's good. Amen. All right, you can stand up now, it's seven o'clock. Amen. <laughs> Second Kings chapter number four in the beginning, in verse, it's just seven o'clock, it's just church time. See, we're getting early. Amen. <clears throat> Chapter number four, in the beginning, verse number eight. It fell on a day that Elisha passed to Shunem, where there was a great woman, great wealthy, wealthy woman there. And, uh, and she constrained him to eat bread. And uh, so as I explained this morning, uh, there was um, um, the great there means um, um, very wealthy. She had, she had a lot. She had a lot of money. She constrained him to eat bread, and uh, it was so. As often as he passed by, he he went to their place. She said to her husband, "This is a holy man of God that comes by us continually." Verse ten. Let's make a chamber. I pray on the wall. Set a bed and a table and a stool and a candlestick. Just give him place to stay. And when he comes here, he can turn. He can stay there. In verse eleven, we got at least a decade that's gone by between verse ten and eleven, according to Jewish history. Fell on a day that he came there, and he turned in the chamber, and he lay there. And this uh, said to Gehazi, his servant, called a Shunammite, and she came up there. And verse thirteen, he said, uh, "Tell her you've been you've been careful. You, you you've been careful with us. You you took care of us. You fed us last ten years." Took care of us, give us a place to stay. You come by and preached in the area, and you give me a hotel room, and you took me to Cracker Barrel, and you fed me. And that's, that's the same process right here. That's why we're doing it now, see? Said, you took care of me, and uh, watch the bit. What can I do for you? I'll go talk to the king, the captain, the host, and last part of verse 13, she said, I dwell among my own people. I'll go talk to the king when I get good and ready, which means she had political clout. He said, well, what's she need? And Gehazi said, she don't have a baby. Her husband's up in years. And he said, tell her to come here. Verse 16, he said, about this time next year, you're going to have a baby. She said, nay, my Lord, man of God, don't lie unto thy handmaiden. She's wealthy. She's got political clout. Got a little spunk in her. You got to love her. She conceived and bare a son. Season Elisha said, that time next year. Now between verse 17 and 18, there's at least 13 years. So we're 23 years into this story from verse four to verse 18, 23 years. Why? Because when he was grown, he had to be at least 13. 
Could have been as high as 15. Fell on a day and went out to his father, working in the field with his father. He said, my head, my head. He said, carried to his mother, verse 20. Brought him to his mother and he died. Sat there till noon and died. Verse 21, mama fell apart, said that's the way God's going to treat me. I'll just quit church. <laughs> no, sir. Laid him on the bed of the man of God and shut up the door. Told her husband, send a young man, one of the asses, I pray, and go see the man of God. Verse 23, he said, it's not church day. It's not new moon. It's not church day. She said, you don't worry about it. It shall be well is what your Bible says. But she said, don't you worry about it. I know what I'm doing. Saddled the ass and the servant and said, put the pedal to the middle, drive, go. Don't let up until I tell you. So went and came the man of God, Mount Carmel. He saw her, told Gehazi, go run to her, verse 25. He ran to her and he said, ask her, how you doing? How's your husband? How's that boy doing? And mama said, it's all just fine. Dead 13-year-old laying on the preacher's bed. And mama went to see the preacher. He said, how's that boy doing? She said, it's good. Wow. <laughs> came the man of God to the hill, caught him by the feet. Gehazi came near to thrust her away. And the man of God said, let her alone. Her soul is vexed within her, and the Lord has hid it from me and not told me. Verse 28. Then she said, then I want a son. Did I tell you don't mess with me about this? Verse 29. He said to Gehazi, get yourself ready, gird your loins, take my staff, put in your hand, go thy way. If you meet anybody, don't even say hi to them. And go lay the staff on the face of the child. The mother of the child said, as the Lord liveth and as thy soul liveth, I will not leave thee. And he arose and followed her. Gehazi went and laid the staff on the boy. Nothing happened. He said, the comeback in the last part of verse 31 said the child's still dead. Verse 32, Elisha went into the house and said, get out of the way, I'll do this. Laid upon the bed, shut the door twice. Prayed. Laid upon the child, hand to hand, eye to eye, mouth to mouth. The child sneezes in verse 35 seven times. And he called Gehazi, called the Shunammite, said, here's your boy. <laughs> boy, that's a story. Isn't that a story? Mama understood the anointing. Father, we thank you, Lord, tonight for your, your anointing upon our lives. We thank you, God, for your precious, precious direction that you have given me. Now, God, we don't have anything laid out here tonight, so help me with a direction, Father, in this house tonight that I can bring forth the life-changing word as we did this morning. Father, we give you praise and honor and glory, and everybody really glad you saved. Shout out loud, amen. Amen. <clears throat> All right, let's sit down and let me just catch you up in case you weren't here this morning. I want to catch you up on what we talked about. I'm not going to re-preach this morning's sermon, although I did read the same text and a little extra to what I did to let you know the rest of the story, and hopefully I'll get concluded tonight. But here is the Shunammite woman, Elisha, who was a protege of a man called Elijah. And I want to talk a lot about Elijah tonight, but let me catch you up. And there's a story that I've just, I've take time to go through it so I don't have to preach it of how that mama said, this is what I wanted. Now this child is dead. I told you don't mess with me about this. And he sent his servant ahead. Now what happened is she grabbed a hold of his feet and the servant went ahead because she said, as the Lord liveth, as my soul liveth, I won't leave you. Let me, let me break that down for you, what she said. She said, look, I appreciate your associate. I appreciate your staff member, but I didn't sow and I didn't give into his life for the last 23 years. I gave into yours. Get yourself in the wagon. We're going to the house, all right? So you have to understand that the point is that anointing, anointings are transferable. And and so what Gehazi had the opportunity to do was take on Elisha's anointing because the anointing Elisha had, he had a double portion. Now, let me break that down for you. 
A double portion anointing is not, is not twice as much. It's, it's been preached that way for years because Elijah raised seven from the dead and, and Elisha uh, raised 14 from the dead. And I know there's an argument theologically there to be made, but the point double portion there is actually two different kinds, which actually means that Elisha knew who he was and knew what his anointing was, but he also had Elijah's anointing himself. And I'm gonna show that to you. Now, we back up to Elijah, who as I told you in the beginning, catch you up this morning was at the brook he's up there ravens are showing up bringing him food every day he's drinking water every day there's a famine down in the valley he's up in the mountain people are dying of starvation and the man of God is not missing one meal why because he understood his anointing was to have to, well, the, the ability he had faith what I call faith for fire he had the ability, he had, he had anointing for elements, okay? He never, Elijah never went through a famine where he ever missed a meal. He could pray fire out of heaven. That's why I told you this morning when he set up the, uh, uh, he prayed 50 soldiers come out to capture him, prayed fire to heaven, consumed them, 50 empty saddles went back into town and 50 more come out and he prayed the same prayer, consumed them. The king sent out a third 50 and the captain of that host fell on the ground and said, help me. <laughs> he said, sound like a smart man. That second one wasn't as smart as that first one was, but that third one caught on, amen? And so when the prophets of Baal, where I left off this morning, when the prophets of Baal says, what should be the sign when, when, when Elijah calls them, meet me on Mount Carmel, and let's just have a God off, and let's find out if Baal be God, we'll serve him. If God be God, then we'll serve him. Now, he's up in a high place where people can see there's 450, listen to me, 450 prophets of Baal. Now, if, you, if you'll take your Bibles, if you would, and go to the book of 1 Kings, I believe it is, 1 Kings. Kings chapter number 17, and uh, you'll find there the story where Elijah just shows up. He just shows up out of nowhere. It says, Elijah, the Tishbat, Tishbite, rather, of the inhabitants of Gilead. Elijah, listen to me, and listen closely, was not a full-fledged Jewish person, okay? Now, in those days, Elijah, in order to be classified as the Jewish bloodline, you had to have a Jewish father and a Jewish mother. You had to be a full-fledged Jew because with God, there are only two ethnicities, and that is Jew and Gentile. Now, now listen closely. You can be any nationality of either one of those two, but when it comes to ethnicities, with God, there is two. Different nationalities, I got that, but ethnicities, there is only two, and that is Jew and Gentile, okay? Elijah was not a full-fledged Jewish man. He was an alien dwelling in a country that he was not from, and that country was Israel. How do you know that, preacher? Because the Hebrew word for Tishbite and the Hebrew word for inhabitants in verse 1 of 1 Kings 17 is the exact same word, okay? Why the King James translators translated the second one into a... Um, Inhabitants, and instead of uh, the first one, Tishbi, I think it's. Uh, um, uh, let, let me see if, if I can pull it up here. Yeah, it's um, um, uh, Tav Shin uh, Bet Yud. Okay, and that's the four letters that make up the word Tish, where Tishbi comes from. But there was no Tishbi; it was not a place. It means an inhabitant, an alien inhabitant of a country where not from. That means Elijah was not considered to be full-fledged Jewish. He was partially Gentile, and with the Jews in that day, and even the Orthodox Jews today, if you are not full-fledged, full-blooded Jewish person, they don't consider you to be a Jew. You have to be Gentile. So has everybody got that? So Elijah is here. He shows up out of nowhere. In chapter 17, he shuts up the heavens. There is no rain. He's up by the brook. Uh, uh, Cherith, he's up there. Uh, that's before Jordan, and and uh, the brook dries up, and the birds don't show. And and <laughs> and and Elijah, thank God, he wasn't a preacher of today, or he'd had a nervous breakdown because God dried up his brook. But he heard the voice of God. He knew what his anointing was. And he went down to the woman at Zarephath, and the word Zarephath means oil refinery, and he says to her, get some water. Yes, I'm trying to catch you up where I cut off this morning. He says, bake me a cake, and, and then, you know, and then I talked to this morning, what a jerk it looked like Elijah was, because he's not missed a meal, little fat, bald-headed preacher, and, and uh, he's wanting this woman to give him his last meal, but it's not because he was trying to run a con with her. He knew the anointing upon him, and anointing are transferable. So therefore, she says, 
I'm down to my last little bit of meal and a little bit of oil, and he says, bake me one first. And the point I ended up with this morning is it is a sad day in your life when a man of God shows up at your church, in your life, or in your home. It is a sad day when a man of God shows up and adapts his message to your lack. If a preacher ever does that, you don't need to listen to him. Because, you understand what I'm saying? Because that adaption to your lack keeps the anointing and the blessings of God because if you understand, if you understand the transference of anointing, what is on me, can get on you. What is on you can get on me, and that's why Billy Graham, anybody that ever gave or blessed Billy Graham, you're entitled to your family being saved. Anybody that's ever been to a Benny Hinn crusade and given an offering or blessed him or prayed for him, you're entitled to healing. You have to understand that. And I said this morning, what the devil had been attacking me for the past six months or so, and even a little bit earlier than that, He's been after the joy that God had given me and my family because if you've ever been in service with me and my family or you've ever been around us at all, then you know we are a family of joy. We laugh, we cut up. Sometimes the pendulum swings way out there too far. I understand that, okay. And uh, But you, you pray for us and we'll pray for you, right? But understand you're entitled to joy because in my family and my bloodline, that's the gifting that God has given me and my family. So see what you are blessed with and what God God gives you to bless others with, that's what the devil wants. Amen? See, the Bible says that Jesus said to Simon Peter, Simon, Simon, Satan had desired to have you that he may sift you as wheat. Why? Because Simon Peter, he could do a roller coaster. He could do it. He just, you know, he's, he's one minute and bless God, let's take them all on grabbing a sword and cutting off a Roman soldier's ear because the soldier ducked because he was swinging at his head, you know? And then three hours later, he's at a campfire throwing a custom fence and said, don't even know Jesus. See, because Simon Peter, once he was in, he was in. But once he was out, he was out. Y'all understand those kind of folk, amen? And they're called extremists. And let's just don't start pointing fingers, all right? But he was an extremist. And so Jesus said, Simon, Satan had desired, and the word there is to lust or to desire to have a lust for, well, not, not for Simon Peter in a physical way, but Satan had desired, lusted after the gifts of Simon Peter because I can use that to tear down lies. And Jesus said, Simon Peter, Simon, Simon, Satan had desired, he's been peering, he's been peeking in the wind at you, and he's been lusting and desiring to have the gift that you were born with, but... See, that, people say, well, you know, the Bible says that Jesus told, that Satan sifted Simon Peter's wheat. No, he didn't. He said, Satan have desired to have you that he may sift you as wheat, but I have prayed for you that when you fail, he didn't say you're not going to fail because the next two verses, he said, you're going to deny me before the sun comes up. He said, but when you fail, your faith don't fail. <laughs> so what was he saying? I know you're going to mess up because I know you, amen. See, what you got to understand the the Holy Ghost knows you better than you know yourself. And he's been there with you since the day that you were born. He knows every mistake you've made. He knew everything that has built your character. So you got to understand the Holy Ghost is with you every day and there is nothing you can do that'll shock him. Isn't that awesome, amen? I shock me sometimes, amen? But there ain't nothing you can do that can shock God because God knows you. Simon, Peter, I have prayed, but I have prayed for thee that your faith not fail, that when you are tried, that your faith doth not fail, that you may strengthen the brethren. What did Jesus say? I know you, I know your giftings and I can use you and Satan's been wanting to use you. And I didn't say you're not gonna fail, I'm just saying I've prayed for you that when you are... Man, there's something right there. But I have prayed for you that your faith don't fail, that when you are converted, that you strengthen the brother. What he said is I've been praying for you because I know you're going to mess up. But when you fall, there it is, I've been praying for you that you don't stay on the ground, that, that when you mess up, that you get back up and strengthen, that you help somebody to go good. <laughs> to help somebody to go through what they need to go through. That's why I had to take you through it. That's why I had to take you through it because when you get over that, then you can help somebody else with what you went through because I had confidence in you that you can get through it. Are you listening to what I'm telling you? That you can get through it, but I know they're going to need some help. They're not as strong as you, and they're going to need somebody who's been through it. See, that's what used to drive me up a wall. I'd go to some camp meeting somewhere, and they'd say, you need to hold on. 
on, hold on. Ain't never been through a hard time in their life. I'm so sick of people telling me to hold on that ain't never had to hold on. Amen. I to go to those meetings, write it down and throw it over your shoulder and just, just throw it out of your life. Good Lord, I wrote up. I, I had a stack of paper, Brother Ken, that tall. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> just stand up, spin around three times and spin it out of your life. And, and you spin, get done, you're dizzy and you still got problems. But when somebody can tell you that they've been through it, let me tell you what God done when I went through that. Let me tell you now, you're not like me and I'm not like you, but when I went through it, God strengthened me. But I have prayed for you that when you fail, you don't stay in a fallen position, but when you get up, you strengthen your brethren. Somebody give him praise and honor for that in here. Thank you, Lord. That's good. All right, now I'm back. So he says here, Elijah says, cook me something first, and she done according to the word of Elijah. See, that's why you got to have confidence in somebody that you trust that they can hear from God on your behalf. Amen. Now, I know people, I've had people in the say, oh, the Lord's calling you here and the Lord's calling you there and the Lord's calling you. No, no, no. So you ain't telling me nothing of where God's calling me. If he ain't told me, I don't need to hear from you. Right. Amen. Amen. <laughs> Hector, Arkansas, years ago in Fallen Water Camp meeting. My brother Dean just pe- preached it last week. And, uh, and, and we, he and I was on the phone. I just, I just kind of reminded me of it. And I remember it was the last time I was talking to this Dean. And he, was, uh, and, uh, he said he preached at Fallen Water uh, last week. I was there back in 1983, maybe, 1983. And uh, a young man came to me. And he said, boy, it's a fallen water camp meeting. And he said, he said uh, and I don't remember what country it was, India, Africa, where it was. And he said, man, the preacher laid hands on me and told me God's calling me to India. Mm-hmm. Well, that's awesome. I said, man, that's awesome. I said, when are you going? He said, man, I'm just, I don't know, I guess I'm gonna start packing and get ready. And if God opened the door. And I called that preacher by name that laid hands on him. And I said, is he going with you? And he said, uh, uh, no. I said, well, you need to get him. Because when you get to India, you're going to need to hear from God. And obviously, you can't hear for yourself, so you need to take him with you. <laughs> he, he never went to India. You know what I'm saying? So see what it is. is God, see, there'll be something in your spirit that God's talking to you, and he'll use the word of God to confirm it through somebody else or a teacher, okay? So when Elijah says to her, he's at Zarephath, and she says, I'm down to the last bit of oil, Okay. If you go over to 2 Kings, my text tonight, and I start in verse number eight, the previous seven verses, you'll find an amazing story. It starts off and it says, well, let's just go there and read it to you. In 2 Kings, chapter number four. Well, somebody remove 2 Kings. There it is. Okay, all right. Now there cried a certain woman, the wives of the son of the prophets, unto Elisha, saying, my ser- thy servant, my husband, is dead, and thou knowest thy servant did fear the Lord, and the creditor has come to take my two sons to be bondmen. Elisha said to her, what shall I do for you? And she said, he said, what shall I do for thee? Tell me what thou hast in the house. And she said, thy handmaiden hath nothing save a pot of oil. Elisha's like, well, I believe I've heard this story. <laughs> See, because of the anointing that was on Elijah was passed to Elisha. So Elisha had his anointing and Elijah's anointing, which gives him double, two different types of anointing. Now see, his servant has died. Gehazi is at least the second servant, and we know that Elisha ended up with the third one. <laughs> he wasn't good at picking staff members. He just wasn't any good at it. So, so and, and, and I'm gonna tell you, and I've, I've dealt with some preachers in large churches that had that same problem. Amen. I've had, I know, three different ministers sit down and say, before I hire anybody else, I'm going to send them to talk to you. Yeah. Come on, guys. This insubordination is not of God. Amen. When you try to circumvent, oh, something just fell right here. When you try to circumvent the authority and the chain of command of God, God cannot bless the house and God will not bless you. Amen. Quite up in here right now. Amen. It doesn't matter whether you agree or not. You have to follow the chain of command. Well, <clears throat> well Brother Caldwell, do you always agree with what Winston McClurg says? Well, I probably don't always agree with what I say. <laughs> Man, 
You agree with what Joe Klein says all the time? Probably not. Well, do you think they're always right? Probably not. But here's a shocker. Neither are you. <laughs> Isn't that amazing? <laughs> and there's the old gal always grabbing about her neighbor. She's always hanging up dirty laundry. I cannot believe that woman's so filthy won't get that laundry clean. And one day she decided to wash her windows and found out it was her windows, not the laundry. <laughs> See, it's very difficult. It's very difficult to pull a toothpick out of your neighbor's eye while you got a telephone pole hanging out yours. Not my brother nor my sister, but it's me, oh Lord, standing in the need of prayer, okay? So understand that Elijah, Elisha has followed him, okay? He, he followed him. Now, how, oh Lord, man, there's a lot here. We may have to go tomorrow night into this, all right? So we have to understand that when Elijah uh, is down at Zarephath, he eats the, 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 till the famine's over. Now, now watch what, let me, let me read it to you here. And uh, let, let's go back to 1 Kings uh, chapter number 17, if you would. And, and I'm, I'm not even sure exactly what the scripture is, but I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to run over there and turn real quick. And uh, let's see. Uh, Elijah in the chamber, it's a, that's a whole same story about there. Okay, verse chapter number 18. And it came to pass after many days that the word of the Lord came to Elijah in the third year, saying, Go, show thyself unto Ahab, and I will send rain upon the earth. Okay, this is a story starting in chapter number 18 that he's going to send rain upon the earth, and then he runs into Jezebel. Oh, now let's get into where we were this morning. Okay, because see, everybody's gotten up. My mom and dad were probably two of the most powerful people when it comes to praying for healing. And, and I, I literally have seen healings from Harold and Lois Caldwell used of God that, that just literally miracles. Look at me, this is not preacher hype. This is not stories. I have seen, right here, look at me, right here with my eyes, I have seen blind people come to church blind and leave seeing. I, deaf people come to church, leave hearing. I've seen it. I have seen people who could not speak clearly leave the church and speak. Crippled people walk. I have seen shortened legs and arms literally extended after 10, 12, 15 years and grow right before your, look, look at me, you, you understand? That, I've seen it, that's not a fairy tale. I've seen it, mom and dad in services praying for people that are divinely healed and couldn't believe God for a $20 bill. Because see, their anointing was, for, they tapped into the anointing of healing and that was, that was their gifting and they understood that of moving people, establishing, getting people called in ministry. But do you understand? You can work in all of the gifts, okay? But now, now God will give you a specific thing. Uh, you know, we, we, we've, we've titled it for years that, that I have faith for fever. If you have a high fever and I pray for you, it's gonna leave. Now, you may not need it to leave. So before I pray for you, you might need to know whether you need to keep the fever or not, whether it's trying to burn out whatever sickness is in you because when I pray for you, your fever's gonna leave. That's just how it is. Now, I wish I had that same faith for cancer. But, but I just, I, I don't know, it, 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 it happened, I guess, in 1992, when my youngest son, Dylan, in Gainesville, Georgia, at Admiral Bimbo Inn at 2.30 in the morning, I prayed for Dylan. His fever broke, and since that day to this, I just have faith for fever. When I tell fever to go, it has to go. Now, understand, but you can work in all the gifts. Mom and dad had a great ministry, changed a lot of lives, but they couldn't believe God for, I'm telling you, couldn't believe God for a $20 bill. They just couldn't. When God began to speak to me in 1997 and began to move me into the area of teaching people how to be free financially and how to be blessed financially, why do you think the devil has attacked me and my family in that area so hard over the years? Why? Because it's the anointing that I begin to tap into. But as I said this morning, if you know who you are, just put the oar in the water and just keep on rowing because God has got a plan to get you to the other side. Amen? He's got that plan. So here we are. All right, Elijah's there, and he goes over here, and, he, and now he runs into Jezebel, and, and the man has got faith to pray fire out of heaven, but he can't deal with the Jezebel woman. <laughs> pray fire out of heaven on her, dude. Kill her. You, you, you know, that'd be my thought. I mean, <laughs> but no, he just, <laughs> y'all got that, don't you, man? And, but he runs up there, and he, look here, God you have to understand, now the stories in the Bible, to be very clear, uh, in, especially in 1st, 2nd Samuel, 1st, 2nd Kings, 1st, 2nd Chronicles, they're not in chronological order. You have to put them in order by studying and know exactly where they are. But understand, Elijah knows his anointing. Now he's running from Jezebel, but I'm, I'm gonna show you something. Right over here, let me, let me find out. I believe it's the last part um, of, um, um, let's see here, just, just hold on a second. 
uh, church. Okay, that's that's chapter number 18. Uh, I, I wouldn't plan on preaching this, so just, just hang with me for a little bit. That's where he's praying fire out of heaven, and he was obedient and saw Ahab. If you go over and you hear, he says to Ahab and the prophets of Baal, meet me up on the mountain, and they have this God off, okay? And I'm gonna show you something in just a moment about the prophets of Baal of when he first said, I hear the sound of abundance of rain because we preach that and Elijah said that after he prayed. He did say, I hear the sound of abundance of rain, but he also said it before he prayed. And I'm gonna show you something very clear of what I believe God is doing right now in America. All right, now let, let, let's face that. We, we, we know over here, Elijah's got 450 prophets of Baal. They're up here on top of the mountain. Everybody's gathered around. And when you take out the light noise and the and the, and all that kind of the noise pollution, all that kind of stuff of today over in Israel, they could, they're, they're looking up at this little mountain here and they're seeing all of this. And the 450 prophets of Baal, and they got this sacrifice laid on the altar. This bullet got him laid out there. And they're waiting for God, for Baal to answer by prayer. They begin to call on fires not coming down. And they're cutting themselves and they're crying out. And Elijah is over there making fun of them. <laughs> I, I, I just love that. I love Elijah, man. It gives me <clears throat> credibility to make fun of some people who actually deserve it. But, but anyway, he, uh, uh, <laughs> some of the best fun you'll ever have in your life is at other people's expense. If you're having a bad day and you've got low self-esteem, come this fall, go to the next county fair and look around. Your self-esteem is going to shoot right up. I promise you that. Amen. These people down at that county fair <laughs> had family tree and got no branches. It's just a stick, all right? And, uh, and I don't know. You may be the person we're making fun of. I don't know. But, but, but nonetheless, understand. <laughs> Damn. And uh, Elijah's over. He's making fun of them, and he calls out. Now, listen to me. Now, now you're going to... You'll need to be very non-religious on this one because if you go read and see what he's hollering, he said, maybe your God's gone. Maybe he's asleep. Maybe he's on vacation. Maybe he's in the toilet. Yeah. Go read it, amen? He says, maybe he's in the toilet and he's making so much noise in the toilet he can't hear you. You pick up on that? That's in the Bible. You know what I'm saying? And he said, maybe he just makes so much noise and told it he can't hear you. <laughs> uh, oh, that just gives me such freedom to be. I <laughs> uh, so understand. So, so I understand. He cries out. Then he gets over and he says, now what we're going to do, we're going to let God. And before he prays a 63, 65 word prayer, have you look at it in the Hebrew or in the English. Before he prays that prayer, he said, bring me 12 barrels of water. Let's get down to the kingdom principles here. He said, bring me 12 barrels of water and dump it out on the sacrifice. Now, now look here. He's saying, if you want God to answer by fire, here's what I need you to do. I need you to go get 12 barrels. I know 12 tribes of Israel has been preached nine ways a Sunday, but here's my take upon it. I need you, he said, to go get 12 barrels of, excuse me, two barrels of water and dump out. Matter of fact, dig a ditch so it can be all around it so the water don't just run off in the ground and soak it up. I need you to go get 12 barrels of water. Why was he having 12 barrels of water? Listen to me. It hasn't rained a drop in three solid years. Dew hasn't even fell. Water is the most valuable thing that they have. Elijah says, you want to hear from God? We're not looking for you to tip him. Oh, Lord, we're on tithe and offering. Hang on, amen. He says, you want to hear from God? You're going to have to give something that means something to you. You're going to give something of value, the most valuable thing they had of three years of drought. Guys, it hasn't, do hasn't failed. Water is, is, is like gold. It's, if you've ever been to Israel there, it's a desert, okay? They have to have water to sustain life. And he said, dump it out. And they dumped it out. Elijah prays a simple little prayer. Fire comes down from God. He knew he had that faith. Out of heaven, it laps up the sacrifice and the water. And then what does Elijah say? He says, take, look here, 450 prophets of Baal. They eat at Jezebel's table. This is in 1 Kings chapter number 18. He said, I want you to take them down to the brook Kishon, I want you to take them down there and I want you to kill all 450 prophets of them. I want you to kill them, every one of them. Now, now watch. And, and it came to pass in meanwhile that the heaven was black with clouds and the wind, there came a great rain and Ahab rolled and went to Jezebel and the hand of the Lord was upon Elijah, he girded up his loins and ran before Ahab and, 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 and to the entrance of Jezreel. But if you go back, he says, I want you to kill the, the, the prophets. In verse number 40, Elijah said, take the prophets of Baal, 
let not one of them escape. And they took them in Elijah, in verse number 40, 1 Kings 17, brought them down to the brook Kishon and slew them there. And Elijah said unto Ahab, get thee up, eat and drink, for there is a sound of an abundance of rain. Now watch, watch guys. This He hasn't prayed yet. He hasn't sent the servant out yet. He said, kill all 450 prophets of Baal that's been in the pulpits that have been eaten at Jezebel's table. The Polit- oh, you better hang with me. It's about to get a little bumpy right here. The political system of that day of Jezebel, the preachers that have been in the pulpit has been catering to that nonsense and has been promoting that nonsense. I need them out of the way. And as soon as the false prophets was out of the pulpit, he said, rains are coming. Hallelujah. Honey, I'm, before he prayed now, he said, I want these false prophets. And you listen to me and you that are watching live by internet, you may be watching even later and looking up and maybe looking for something on me. I don't matter. You listen to me. Preachers in this nation have for several years been just cowed down and promoting, promoting politicians that are from the pit of hell because of either their political political uh, affiliation or it, you better listen to me or either because of ethnicity it does not matter I am here to state firmly and boldly that those preachers have got to repent or God's going to move them out of the pulpit because as soon as the false prophets in this nation are out of the pulpit I do declare to you that I hear in America the sound of an abundance of rain and it's headed for restoration to bring this nation back around to the things of God Somebody give him praise and honor in here tonight. It's going to happen. So in that process, he said, kill all 450 prophets. Watch this. Watch this. The biggest enemy that Elijah had was destroyed. God answers and his enemy is gotten rid of. When you give to God in a tough time, he will answer you and get rid of your biggest God almighty in heaven and get rid of your biggest enemy at the same time. And then you go to chapter 19. (laughs) I love this one here. He said, uh, let's go pray. He goes and prays in chapter 18. Had the prophets are dead. He goes and prays. Servants went, what do you got? And which I believe, by the way, that was Elisha. <laughs> I'll let that and soak in, all right? And he said, what do you see? I don't see nothing. Seen one, two, three, or five, six times. Look here, what you have to do as a man of God, okay, you have to keep proclaiming to the people what they're going to see until they actually see it. He just kept saying, Go out and look. Don't see nothing. Keep looking. Comes back the seventh time. He said, I see a cloud the size of a man's hand. Now, I stand you on Mount Carmel. And you look out toward that Mediterranean Ocean. You hold your hand out there. Son, you talk about a thunderstorm. It was a thunderstorm. And Elijah said, I hear the sound. Says it again. Of an abundance of rain. After three years, we're about to get soaked here. Now, watch, guys. Tell Ahab, get his horses ready. I'm gonna I'm on, I'm on, I'm on grab my split tail gown and I'm gonna gird up my loins. <laughs> he got on sandals. And he's gonna run and he outruns the fastest horses. Now y'all here in Kentucky, y'all know a little bit about horses. Come on, don't you? Y'all just had a triple winner, triple crown. Y'all be proud of that. Oh, yes, yeah, man. How many people way down south that freak out that I'm talking about be proud of a horse at the betting track? And yeah, okay, that's, <laughs> that's kind of how I roll. I mean, you got any, you got any, got any tips, preacher? I do. <clears throat> I do. Next time the race, the horse race comes around, I just, just bet everything you got. Put everything you own on the rider, on the white horse, and the last race, because he's coming through. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> As a cheap shot, but it worked, obviously. All right. So he girds up his loins. Horses can run 30 to 35 mile an hour, an average horse. 
king had the best horses. That doesn't mean that Ahab's getting his horse together and Elijah takes off, I'm gonna beat him the gates of Jezreel. You know, it's a minimum, it's, look here, how many's been to Israel and I've stood you on Mount Carmel and showed you the valley of Jezreel? It's 17 miles. Elijah had to outrun a horse for 17 miles. Now, I don't know how you look at it here in Kentucky, but where I come from, that's what we call picking them up and setting them down. <laughs> Moving on, amen. Elijah outruns horses for 17 miles to the gates of Jezreel. Why the gates of Jezreel? Why? Okay, the gates of Jezreel was where the crossroads were, and that same crossroad, the Marist Way, is still there today. It's a highway that was used in Elijah's day, a pathway, not, not the asphalt pavement. Don't anybody freak out, all right? It was used, mile markers, every mile they had them, every quarter of a mile they had them. Romans put them up in Jesus' day. That crossroads is still there. And you know what is there now? The Valley of Armageddon. Same spot where Jezebel ruled from, spiritual geographical, will be destroyed in the last day at the same spot. Man, I love that. Now watch. He gets to Jay, Look, do you know in Elijah's day, they had no newspapers, no television, no radio. They literally got news to people by word of mouth, and you would go to the city. And they'd done what was called in the Bible, several times you'll find it, they sat in the gates of the city because they had what in New England they called them town criers. They went through telling the news, okay? Unlike these liars we have nowadays. <laughs> uh, go Donald Trump, all right? Tear them up, son. Can't believe you're treating us that way. Well, quit lying. How many times have you seen ABC, NBC, CNN, MSNBC, and Fox News itself in the last two years had to get on TV and apologize because what they told wasn't true. You know, everybody they told the lie to wasn't reached by the apology. So there's still people believing the lie. I want to know, where do you get your news? Where do you even get the truth? Where do you get the truth anymore? We don't have journalists. We don't have journalists that report. We have active journalists who have an agenda that is out to destroy people. I don't believe none of them. When Israel shot down that drone a few months ago from Syria, for seven days, I watched every news channel. I watched every one of them, and not a one of them, including Fox News, told the story. Not a one of them told the whole thing. I have on that iPad right there video from the Black Hawk helicopter that shot the drone down. I got it myself. I know what happened. And not a one of them told the truth about it. So where do you get your news from? Before you believe something about somebody, maybe you ought to find out if it's true. Stop here and let shout. Okay, I guess, I guess we missed that, all right? I, look here. So Elijah says, okay, get your horses ready. Texas running. See, in the gates of the city is where they told the news from. So watch. He said, I, I hear the sound of abundance rain. What's coming? An overwhelming abundance of what you just poured out. When you give in a tough time, God will answer, get rid of your biggest enemy and send an abundance of what you just dumped out. And then it got to the gates of Jezreel before Ahab. Why? Because Baal was a false god of elements. And God, it was a god of elements. And God could not allow Ahab to get to the news center and say, Baal's going to make it rain. So God didn't get credit for it. So God anoints a man to run at least 17 miles at 35 miles an hour. <laughs> to keep the devil from getting credit for what God was at. See, when you pour out and you give in a tough time, God will answer, get rid of your biggest enemy, send an abundance of what you poured out and shut the devil's mouth all at the same time. <laughs> and then he passes that on to Elisha. Oh, where am I at? I don't need to continue this tomorrow night. I need to finish this tonight, okay? 
Elisha, watch. Is, is this good with anybody here, man? I, I preached for years, okay? And I, I know some of y'all are cold, but don't y'all dare turn that air conditioning down. Y'all just wrap up. <clears throat> I preached for years because I heard it preached. And my dad would preach. And you know where Elisha was when Elijah saw him? He was out in the middle of the field. Okay? And I preached. He's out there plowing, and, and dad used to preach it, and he heard other people preach it. So I used to grab it, just grabbed it and preached it. He was out there plowing, and he come by, and his mantle brushed by Elisha. You, you, know, you shake your head, you preach it too, had you? Oh, yeah, okay, right, yeah. yeah. And it brushed by him, and Elisha said, Whoo, I got to have some of that. Whoo, shunda, hunda, give me some of that. <laughs> yeah. Burn the plow, kill the cow. See you, Mom and Dad. <laughs> That's actually where the phrase, How now, brown cow, came from. But uh, <laughs> not true, I don't know that for sure, right? But that ain't what happened. The Bible says that Elijah saw him and he went to Elisha and he laid his mantle on him. See, Elijah chose Elisha. I'll tell you why he done that, Vern. Why, of all the people, see, Elijah knows he's leaving. So he's looking for somebody to pass it on to. So, so why did he pick Elisha? Now, what was he doing? He was plowing. And they got to get things in chronological order. He sees a man out there plowing. He takes his mantle, lays on him, and says, this is the one I want. Why, watch. Why? Because he was plowing with 12 yoke of oxen, 24 cows. Well, that ain't strange. Hold on, I ain't done. The average length of an oxen the space you have to put between the yokes is about 98, right at 100 feet. Here's a man plowing with 100 feet of beef. And Elijah picked him. Well, you never seen anybody plow before? Sure, but watch. Watch the circumstance. Elijah sees a young man plowing with 100 feet of beef, and it ain't rained a drop in three years. Now, ain't that something? Everybody else done quit. That's plowed over field. Elijah's, Elijah's like, you boys give up if you want to. I know it's dry and the dust is flying. There's dirt clods everywhere, but it's going to rain someday. I'm going to be ready for it when it gets here. <laughs> Come on. So that's why he picked him. Okay, so that's why in the tough time, you got to, what's the old saying? Keep on keeping on, baby. See, because when it gets tough and you sit down, I've told my kids for years, when you're driving and you get in a, a, a rainstorm, people turn on their flashers and pull over the side of the road, get on a bridge. Don't you dare. Don't turn on your flashers. Get down to 10 mile an hour if you have to, but don't quit. Why? Because you'll be in the storm longer. <laughs> See, if you're driving and the storms are coming, you stop, you got to wait till the storm's over. But if you just keep on going, you're going to get out quicker. Now, come on. Huh? I've told my kids that. Don't ever quit, amen. That's why. Have you ever seen that little cartoon of that stork swallowing that frog? It starts, they got that frog, and that frog's got four legs hanging out. It's back there, okay? And he's reached around and got that stork by the throat and says, don't ever quit, amen? That's, that's what you, look here. The, there is something to be said about tenacity. Come on, guys, y'all get with me right now because I'm preaching to me right now, okay? There's something to be said about tenacity in a tough time. When the storm is raging, the wind is blowing, the thunder is rolling, the hail is falling, and you don't know what to do, keep on keeping on because it, this too shall pass. Somebody give him praise and honor in here, amen? So see, the anointing that Elijah had for that tenacity was passed to Elisha. And you see Elisha in the field, and if you put the, 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 the books in chronological order and the chapters in chronological order, you'll find out that Elisha followed Elijah for 19 years, and his name is not even mentioned for 19 solid years. But then all of a sudden, you go over to the book of 2 Kings, chapter number three. The kings of Israel and the king of Judah, in verse number nine, uh, <clears throat> the king of Edom fetched a compass seven days' journey. 
And there wasn't no water. Then he touched something. No water. Got another problem here. Israel still has that problem. Verse 10, the king of Israel said, Alas, the Lord has called these three th kings together, delivers in the head of Moab. Stop hanging out with people who talk defeat. Come on. Three kings and the king of Israel. You know, Israel's been divided. Israel and Judah. King of Israel said, well, we're defeated. Well, you might be. I'm not. <laughs> That's that frog. <laughs> okay, watch. But Jehoshaphat, verse 11, said, is there not here a prophet of the Lord that we may inquire the Lord by him? And one of the king of Israel's servant answered and said, here's Elisha, the son of Shaphat, who poured water on the hands of Elijah. Boom, there he is. After 19 years of serving, when his time came for his anointing, <laughs> Elijah's gone. There's Elisha sitting over there with the sons of the prophets. Those are two great books. You ought to read those books. They're really good, okay? He's sitting over there, and when the time comes, what do they need? They needed water. They needed water. And he said, Elisha, Jehoshaphat said the word of the Lord when he went down to him, verse number 13. And Elisha said to the king of Israel, what have I got to do with you? Look at verse 13. What have I got to do with you? He said, get to the prophets of your father, the prophets of your mother. And the king of Israel said, that, nay, the Lord has called these three kings together and delivered them in the hand of Moab. Watch verse 14. And Elisha said, as the Lord of hosts liveth before whom I stand, surely were it not that I regard the presence of Jehoshaphat, the king of Judah, I would not look toward thee nor see thee. You know what Elisha just said? He got the boldness of Elijah. He just said, that old boy's talking negative. If it wasn't for who you was hanging out with, I wouldn't give you the stinking time of day. You know what that tells me? There is such a thing as increase through association. Is anybody getting anything out of this right now? So if there's increase through association, there's also a decrease. Well, I, I just I had pastors come in. I just, man, I've just, I've lost people. They left the church. Well, let them go. You ain't got no more stability than that. And things get tough. You know, we got preachers standing in the pulpit that are under stress because they know they're preaching to fair weather Christians. At the first sign of a storm, they're going to be gone. Did I get sidetracked? Oh, I don't have any notes. We're just here and talk, all right? And Elisha said, bring me a musician. Verse 15, musician played. And watch, in verse 16, thus said the Lord, make this valley full of ditches. For thus said the Lord, you shall not see wind, neither shall you see rain, Yet that valley right over there shall be filled with water that you can drink, your cattle and the beast. And it's just a light thing in the sight of the Lord. In verse 18, and by the way, he's going to deliver the Moabites, your enemy, into your hand. And you're going to smite every one of them. Now, ain't that something? He said, dig the ditches. Dig it. Now, it's not going to thunder. Wind's not going to blow, and you're not going to see rain, but the water's coming. <laughs> Preacher said, dig. I only got to dig. Ain't got no water now. I was sweating and losing body fluids. <laughs> Why do you got to always try to analyze everything? Do you know you cannot rationalize what only comes through revelation? Amen. And so, therefore... Just dig. I could pass over this particular point, but I don't think I will. See, when the preacher talks about tithe and offering, you don't need to grab about it. You just need to tithe and offer. Why? Well, it's a tough time. When you're given a tough time, God answers, gets rid of the biggest enemy, sends in abundance, Shuts down the devil's mouth. And if you don't dig the ditch, the water's coming. And if you don't prepare in advance, 
when the water gets here, instead of having something to store up, all you get to do is enjoy a flash flood. See, Elisha said, boy, ain't this God heavy tonight, amen? See, Elisha said, dig the ditch. Why? Because the water's coming. And if you don't prepare to have something to keep it in, when it gets here, you're just going to get a little bit of rain, and then you're going to be back in a drought again. Boy, don't that sound like church people. Now, not y'all. Them other churches we talk about, you know. You know? Elijah said, dig the ditch. Well, well, what for? Shut up and dig. Just shut up and get a shovel and dig. Why? Because the water's coming. Look, watch. Ain't going to rain. Wind ain't going to blow. Oh, get ready. Brace yourself. Here's a nugget. You're going to remember this one for a long time. Wind ain't going to blow. Forget the thunder and the lightning. And you're not going to see any rain, but the water's coming. See, in the kingdom of God, it does not have to be spectacular to be supernatural. <laughs> you should write that down right there. See, because you know what Pentecostals do? Shoo, up. And that's all grand. But it don't have to be spectacular to be supernatural. I shared with Pastor Hagee several years ago, and now we're talking. And I showed him this little video. And I'm sure it was a church in Kentucky. I mean, it had to be. It's a little, it had to be Kentucky, Arkansas. Amen. And uh, <laughs> can I tell you all something that got nothing to do with spirituality? It just got my mind, okay? It's, it amazes me for years, the alien spacecraft that keeps showing up. I've been chasing it since 1947. It keeps showing up, you know? I just, that's amazing. Because somewhere out there, we got a long weekend coming. Labor Day, let's go to Earth. <laughs> y'all load up the spaceship. Y'all get potato salad, get some drinks. Now, you kids, y'all go to the toilet. I ain't got time to be stopping every planet. <laughs> come on, come on. I can't be stopping every planet, y'all. Go to the toilet right now. And every time they come to Earth, you think just once since 1947, they'd landed. You know what? They won't see Disney World. The Grand Canyon, maybe. Nope. It's always a hog farm in Kentucky. <laughs> Chicken farm in Arkansas. Come on, y'all. <laughs> you know it's true. <laughs> Where was I at? Okay. I'll think of it in just a minute. <clears throat> okay, I got it. It does not have to be spectacular to be supernatural. If you prepare in advance then you don't just enjoy the flash flood. Okay? Now, let me tell you, let me tell you what, let me tell you what, men, 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 whatever back here. God has blessed us financially. He's blessed us, okay? And, and, and right now, financially, we've took a hard lick. One, one of the toughest we've ever been through. One of the toughest we've been through. So you know what we've decided? We're going to load every bit of debt we got. That's what I'm thinking about. Listen to me. And I'm asking God, ask God today for some confirmation on it. I'm thinking about selling everything I got. Bed, chairs, couch, tables, house, go. All of it. Come on. Huh? Because I need to prepare myself for blessings. Because I know this time we're going through, it's not going to last. This too shall pass. So I need to be prepared. Because take a deep breath. This one's going to sting for me. Because in the process of an abundance in the past, I didn't prepare. Now, now I did to last six months without income. That's a pretty good preparation. We, we made it through, okay? But I gave last year everything I had. At a time when God told me to give, I gave. So I know there's seed in the ground. I know the ditch has been dug. See, watch what happens. He said, oh, Lord, have mercy. You're going to defeat the enemy. In verse 20 of 2 Kings chapter number 3, in verse 20, and it came to pass in the morning. They've dug the ditches. Now, these are three kings with three armies. You know how many ditches they dug? Three armies and the cows and all the food, that the, the, the livestock they took. You know, when you moved an army, you had to take, you know, livestock to feed them. 
There's enough water for all three armies, all the beasts they had, all the cattle they had. When did it happen? And it came to pass in the morning when the meat offering was offered that behold, the water came by way of Edom and the country was filled with water. They're in a tough time. They need water. He said, dig the ditch. It ain't gonna be spectacular, but it's gonna be supernatural because that valley is gonna be full of water and it didn't happen until the next morning when offering time came. Can you believe we all up in this tonight? Now watch. And when the Moabites, verse 21, heard that the kings were come up to fight against them, they gathered, everybody put on their armor, verse 22, and they rose up early in the morning and the sun shone upon the water and the Moabites saw the water on the other side as red as blood. And they said, this is blood. The kings have surely slain and they have smitten one another. Now therefore Moab to the spoil. And when they came to the camp of Israel, Israel, the Israelites rose up and smote the Moabites. Now hold on, hold on. Let's analyze this. Somebody's complaining. And Elisha said, if it wasn't who you was hanging out with, I wouldn't give you a stinking time of day. But nevertheless, give me some music. Thus saith the Lord God, Make the valley full of ditches. Ain't gonna be spectacular, but it's gonna be supernatural. And the next morning at offering time, the water came and when the enemy saw it, they thought it was blood. When you are obedient in a tough time in your life, your obedience looks like blood to the devil. Lord, if I ain't laying some stuff out tonight, all right? <laughs> Look here. Not only did they smite their enemy, they went all the way back, chased them back. Go read it, because I'm out, my hour's up, all right? They went all the way back, smote every good piece of land. If you've ever been to Israel, it's hard to find good land to have a crop. You know what you gotta do? You gotta go in and move the rocks. It says you're gonna smite their good land with stones. Three full-fledged kings with full-fledged armies. Everybody carried rocks in their pockets and with the cows. And when it got to their good fields, they dumped all the rocks. Oh, wouldn't that make you fighting mad? <laughs> but see, not only did they get victory, but they spoiled the enemy. Because see, this is, this, is, this is God's pattern. When you are faithful and you're going through a trial and he's trying to teach you, he's got a blessing plan for you. And he's usually planning on taking it from the enemy and giving it to you. Isn't that awesome? So, well, that's another whole hour. I still ain't done, all right? I don't know, but we might do it again tomorrow night, all right? But see, watch. The anointing of Elijah was transferred to Elisha. That's how the Shunammite, as I told you this morning, knew that her son and she said, it is well, because the anointing of Elisha was to raise people from the dead. But he also had Elijah's anointing, which meant for elements. That's how he could call water. That's how the woman who the husband had died and, and the creditors come and take her son to be bonded. I got a little pot of oil, bar all the vessels, pour out, pour out, pour out, fill it up, sell, pay off your debt and live off the rest. Why? Because that anointing that he had came from Elijah. But his double portion meant he had two different anointings. Which means if Gehazi would have kept his head screwed on straight, he could have had three different anointings. Amen. And he didn't. And I may do that tomorrow night. I may not. You may have to go figure it out yourself. Okay? But Gehazi was there with the Shunammite. Was there with the Shunammite and his anointing, Gehazi's anointing, go check it out. He, he, was, he had a great anointing. He was able to speak in the ears of leaders, warriors. When Naaman the leper came, he chased him down and a head of the army stopped and gave a servant, 
shouldn't even gave him the time of day in those days. But he did. Because of the anointing that was on his life. What you got to do is tap into what you are. And who you are. Amen? And when God begins to give you a double portion and gives you another anointing, it doesn't mean the one you had is dead. It means the one, the anointing that you have will be coupled with the new anointing. Wow. Hallelujah, man, that's heavy. Said, that's for you, that's for me. The anointing that you have can be coupled with the new anointing that God has given. But see, you've got to learn how to work what you got. So that's why it bothers me when young preachers say, well, well God's called me the missions field and I'm, 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 I'm going to India. That's awesome. It doesn't bother me you're going to India. But it does bother me if there's one Indian person in your community that you ain't told about Jesus. Why would God call you to a country full of people that you refuse to witness to in your own city? Come on. So if God's called you to Russia, what you need to do is find the Russians in your community. Why well, ain't no Russians around here? Have you looked? Let me, let me tell you what's going on. I'm going to quit right here. I have a copy of a letter that was sent from the rabbinical council in Jerusalem that was sent in late January, February of last year. The rabbinical council, the rabbis of Jerusalem that even Netanyahu will go and counsel with and talk before decisions are made. They sent a letter to two world leaders asking them to come to Israel and build the third Jewish temple. The rabbinical council of Jerusalem has asked two world leaders to come to Jerusalem. And they were sent in late January, February of last year. And I have a copy of it. <laughs> I got a few connections. Of course, you know, you've already figured it out. One of those world leaders was Donald Trump. The rabbinical council that's wanting the temple built, and they believe when the temple's built, the Messiah's going to show up. You know what? I believe the exact same thing. <laughs> I'll wait on you to figure that out on the way home, all right? They're looking for his first coming. I'm looking for his second one. All right? And they have sent a letter to Donald Trump to request that he come, because you know what? He has made it publicly known that he'd like to see that temple built. And there's another world leader that they sent to because the other world leader has also made it publicly known and privately and now publicly he has made it known he would love to see the Jewish temple built on the Temple Mount. Vladimir Putin. Now you tell me that this lie that they got going about Russia and, 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 and Donald Trump, tell me that ain't from the devil. Because if those two hook up and the two most powerful countries on the planet want to see the temple built, I believe it's going to be built. And you know, there's got to be a Messiah. <laughs> Does that not stir you up? <laughs> I'm just saying to you guys, that's why the church, and I won't say it, I, I don't care, care you like it or not, you better get involved in this fall's election. The church better show up. The church better show up like they did in November of 16. You better show up. You better get everybody you know to show up. Okay? Because I'm telling you, God's going to get this thing done. He's going to get it done with or without us. I just don't want to be when he comes back on those that didn't do anything. Amen. Amen? All right. This might be good enough to have a third service on. <laughs> yeah, might do it. Because, boy, and I get over, you get over in the second Kings after chapter four, you go over chapter five and Naaman and chapter six and they're surrounded and Gehazi's done end up with leprosy. And, and, 
go to chapter six in there. Having dove dung soup. You really ought to read your Bible. There's some stuff in there. Go to chapter seven. Four lepers at the gate said, why sit here till we die? And, oh, we just might do that. I don't know. There's some heavy, heavy stuff right there, okay? I'm just saying, the anointing, guys, it is transferable, okay? It is transferable. So be careful. Be careful. Not all cries, Lord, Lord. So when you go to partner up with anointing, make sure you try the spirit. See, that's good. Now look here. Look here. Not look here. I got. I got to quit. Look here. There's no business. You want know, somebody to say, you know, well, would you do this? Would you do that? We need you to help here at the church. Well, brother Joe, sister Robin, I just, I just want to be used. Well, you know we got brother Caldwell. He's coming. We need somebody to work the nursery. Well, I would. I'm just not good with children. But keep me in mind. I just want to be used. Well, you know, we're going to need some people to hand out some flyers and tell them we're going to have revival. Oh, well, you know, I, I really, I, I really, well, I want to be used, but I'm just not good talking to people. Not good on knocking doors, but keep me in mind, I just want to be used. No, you just want to be noticed. <laughs> oh, had a good sermon, just shot in the foot right there at the last, didn't I? <laughs> See, what you find to do, you do with all your might. Doesn't matter. Well, if I can remember about tomorrow night, if I can remember about, boy, oh, man, we may do this. Good. Y'all need to come back tomorrow night. I can, I can tell it's going to be good. So here's the deal. Okay. You know who you are. Follow the Spirit. Partner up. But if you're asked to do something, do it as unto the Lord. I'm, that's so business. I, well, I, you know, I appreciate the offer, but I, I'm going to go pray and I'm see how I feel led. I'm so tired of that. See, the problem is we got too much lead. Didn't get some lead out. Yeah. I just wanted years ago, I wanted to get this little block of lead set on my desk. Next time I said, well, I won't feel lead. Well, here, feel that. Now get up and do what I told you. <laughs> get up and do what I asked you to do. Because I'm going to listen to me, guys. I'm going to listen to me. Listen to me. Religion, and you know where I stand on it, is the most evil thing Evil is the, the most evil, religion, the most evil thing ever concocted by Lucifer himself. And I'm telling you, I truly believe, and I said this morning for the first time publicly, when Jesus returns very soon, it's going to be so unlike what we believed. Amen. Literally, I believe some opposite of what we were taught at his return, that I believe some of the biggest opposition that Jesus will have on this planet will be the established church. I'm telling you guys, it's crazy. Because when you look at Matthew 17 and see the symbolism of the rapture, he went up into the mountain. They saw Moses and Elijah, Jew, Gentile, resurrected dead, raptured saints, olive tree, wild, grafted in branch. And Jesus, as we'll see him on that day, transfigured before them, he called up his disciples, Peter, James, and John. Jesus had 12 disciples, and he called up three. If, 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 if that is symbolism of the rapture, that tells me only 25% of Christians is going to the rapture. That's something to think about. I said if, I don't know that. I'm just saying. Symbolism, not study. Because it's not all the crowd, Lord, Lord, is going to enter in. So you know what? I want to be right. I want to be right. So preacher, my God, preacher, 75% of us are not going to the rapture. I didn't say that. That's not what I said. There'll be some churches, 100% of the people go. I'm talking about Christian life as a whole on the planet. Okay? Aren't you glad? Aren't you glad you're not like that bunch up north? Aren't you so glad? <laughs> and always apply to somebody else if you need to. I love you. I hope you've enjoyed tonight's preaching, teaching. I hope you got some out of it. I'm just going to go ahead and quit. Come on, Pastor Joe. Give the Lord a hand clap of praise. Amen. Wow. Heavy word about a uh, powerful, powerful blessing of God called the anointing. And what, 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 what an awesome word. I just, that's going to, so good. 
Well, listen, we, we definitely want to give you an opportunity to sow into the ministry of Dr. Randy Caldwell. Uh, please don't pass this up like he's saying. Uh, I don't need to go into it and go over it again. He, if you heard the message and, and how we release it, God will bless it and then return it back. Brothers, if you would, come on. It would be wrong of us not to give you an opportunity to do that. Prepare an offering and what the Lord puts on your heart. I know he'll bless you. Go ahead, brother. Bless this. Father, once again, we thank you for your love, kindness, and mercy. Father God, we thank you for your true word. Thank you, Father, for this brother and his family, all the brothers and sisters, Father, that you sent this way. Father, we praise you. We thank you for the opportunity to sow this seed into your kingdom. Father God, we praise you and we love you. In the precious name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, we pray. Amen. dismissed for the night though I do want to give somebody an opportunity to pray or get prayed for if uh, something's on your heart that you need to, to receive prayer or you need to pray and uh, if you don't know Jesus Christ your Savior if you've not got a covenant with him as he was talking about and talking about the rapture of the church he's talking about the coming of the Lord he is coming folks he's coming so if your heart's not right or not where it needs to be with the Lord, you have an opportunity. Please don't pass it up if he's stirring your heart. Definitely don't want to close the service out before we do that. Give somebody an opportunity for prayer. All right. All right. Did you enjoy the message tonight? Tonight, this morning? And to see if he's going to do a part three or a part C, you'll have to come back tomorrow night. Tomorrow night it'll be 7 o'clock. We did start at 6 tonight, be 7 tomorrow night, 7 Tuesday night. So if you can, come out and be with us. Also, uh, invite somebody. Tell somebody that uh, Dr. Caldwell's here, and, and he guarantee them they'll be blessed because uh, I know we've been blessed. Wonderful service. Robins, there anything more? We good? All right. Let's everybody stand. Let's thank the Lord for the service tonight, and I'll speak a blessing over you before we leave. Father in heaven, we come before you tonight again, give you praise. We just thank you for meeting with us. Thank you for using Dr. Caldwell. Lord, the, the word is so powerful, so strong, and when we're told in your word, it's sharper than any two-edged sword. Father, we ask you to go with us and keep us safe. Give us traveling mercies, and Lord, gather us all back together at your appointed time. 
and we will never fail to give you the praise that you so deserve. May the Lord bless you. May the Lord keep you. May his face shine upon you. May he be gracious unto you. May he lift up his countenance upon you. May he give you peace. In the name that's above every name, the name of Yeshua, Hamashiach, Jesus the Christ, our Lord and our Savior, we pray. And the whole church said, Amen. Amen. Everybody be blessed.